Big Footy Port LA podcast is proudly sponsored by New Vision. My team, Kanda, power. I love the power. power, power. I love the power. power, power. G'day everyone, Mac 19 here and this is the Big Footy Port LA podcast coming to you live on Port Fan Radio. And look, joining me in the co-host chair once again, we've got Porsche. Good evening, Macca. How are you? Good, good. And yourself? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been driving all day, so I'm extremely tired, but I'm pretty psyched about the fact that I could get a Friday night football tomorrow night. So it's uh, it's going to be a good That's weekend. It. Love it, love it. And we've got two guests on tonight. So it's Cast of Thousands here on the podcast. The first is Dylan. Welcome back. Good day. Thanks for having me back. And uh, secondly, El Scorcho. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me again. Always love to come Crazy. on. Absolutely. So it's, it's essentially the John Butcher happy hour here this evening. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that any time you talk about John Butcher, it's probably the John Butcher happy hour, because when else would you? <laughs> true. Harsh, but true. Present. I think it's, it's, you know, yeah, to be on with uh, a couple of pretty astute Very footy judges who are both uh, big Butcher fans is pretty good, as are most astute footy judges, in my opinion. Mm. <laughs> uh, yeah. And so am I, am I the only real sort of I don't know about John Butcher person on this podcast? Is that is that my role? Uh, I like, won't have it. I won't have Mac it. Is, <laughs> Mac is firmly in that camp as well. There's a bit of oh, yeah, look, I'm, I'm on the fence. I'm on the fence. Yeah. There wasn't enough Butcher hired for last podcast of mine, so we're here. Mm. <laughs> we, we thought we'd solve that this week and get yeah. uh, El Scorcho on and Dylan. So. Should be a good one. That's it. Before we get on to the preview for the Hawthorne game, might as well mention the fact that uh, Jackson Trengove has had season-ending soldier, uh, shoulder surgery, which means he can probably complete a full pre-season, which is fantastic. Uh, seems a pretty smart move at this stage of the year. Yeah, I think it's probably a bit of a... I mean, it's a pretty obvious move to start doing that this time of year. Um, yeah, I, if he can stay, if he can have a full pre-season, that's great, but just... Sometimes, I don't know, you see players sort of end the season a bit early and then they have a complication during pre-season anyway. It doesn't really help much, necessarily. But, yeah, hopefully. Um, it'll be good to have him fighting fit for the start of next year, if that's possible. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I reckon, hopefully, we can get Cleary a few more games because I think he was really unlucky to be dropped. And, you know, uh, obviously, we've moved things around a little bit. But for whatever reason, we've decided to leave him in the SNFL side. So, hopefully, uh, over the last couple of games, he'll get a, another gig so we can see what he can do. Yep. Got to qualify for those SANFL finals, man. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's all important. <laughs> Super important. I was, I was pretty surprised actually that he was going in for surgery. Now I thought it was a, I didn't think it was that big of a, a deal because he played a really good game against GWS. Actually, it's yeah. full of mongrel. It's pretty exciting. And then to see him, see him dropped and out for the season was a bit surprising for mine. But if it helps him, then yeah, all for it. Absolutely. How have we seen his year this year? He's sort of been well talked about on the forum that he's maybe he's been a little bit down on form, but I've actually thought he's been pretty consistent this year. I think yeah. he's been pretty standard. Uh, just in defence, he's been standard. He's just dropped that uh, that ruck, um, you know, factor from his game that used to be so damaging. And I think we can all probably think of a few games where he went into the ruck in the last quarter and just kind of wheeled us over the line. Um, one of the showdowns, uh, I think that the last showdown at was a showdown 35 where we, with the Monfrey's vet bounce where he went in. Uh, you know, his rucking can be so damaging just because of how competitive he is. So he's a, he's a good, solid key defender, and he's had a good, solid key defender year, but he probably lost a bit of X factor that he was he had with uh, with playing in the rut, which has been a bit of a shame. I hope he comes back to that next year. Yeah, absolutely. I think with the rest of the team as well, we lost a bit of mongrel. Obviously, I think he sort of improved a bit in the last couple of weeks, but yeah, for the whole team, he, he was sort of the instigator and really really the hard ass, but he wasn't really around for for a lot of incidents, especially that oh, I can't remember now, but yeah, um yeah, he you expect him to be the guy who's jumping in in, in defence for his teammates, but he wasn't really around for that this year. Which is a bit disappointing. But he's been alright. He's got a, he's had to deal with Carlisle being it being out for most of the season, which yeah. severely impacted the form of Homsch as well. And Jonas obviously went completely downhill. So considering it did pretty right, yeah. Jacket. Yeah. Yeah, look, um, I think that he's had a quiet year compared to previously, and absolutely it's related to that role change. I think, though, that 
um, when you when you've got the the very tight matchups, you can't really afford to be necessarily the player that goes and sticks up for everyone else because then your man gets away from you. And I think that's probably something you might have been a bit more conscious about this year. Um, it has hurt him occasionally in the past, but um, yeah, it's, it, I guess it's not really a problem um, to have a, a key position backman not be a star player because usually. Um, having a key position back when it's a star player generally means you're a really shit side um, and you can look through any mm. all Australian side and that tends to be the position <laughs> that goes to a shit side is the full back or the centre half back because they are able to excel because there's so much stuff happening around them so if he's quieter then I'm not necessarily concerned with that I, I think that um, I think our defence this year has actually been pretty good and he's been part of that so particularly with Carlo yeah. Yeah. I think he's just gone about his business. I don't think he's really been beaten all that often, maybe once or twice. But apart from that, he's sort of done his job. I agree he hasn't really had that sort of mongrel in him that he's had in previous seasons. But you know, he's done his job, and that's uh, all we've really needed down back, I think. And there's certainly been worse players that have played every week. Absolutely. I think that mongrel has just been across the team and club. And there's been a lot of discussion, I guess, on the on the port board about it. Just that we just seem to be just very, very weak and being everyone's best friend and we don't want to upset anyone and we don't want to give away any freeze or anything like that. Until last week and, you know, it was, you know, I think the crowd really got into it and the, the players seemed to lift uh, with all the little um, kind of scuffles that were going on. So I, I hope we take it to horse all this week and I hope we, we end the season really physically and try and impose ourselves on, on the teams we play. Yep. Yeah, um, particularly with the avoiding free kicks part. Um, I, th- I think it's one of the things for the NFL that I, was stuck in my mind is that the New England Patriots have a reputation for unsociable football themselves, and part of that is that they will always push every limit as far as refereeing is concerned. And it's just the golden rule that, you know, if you are constantly just slightly breaking the rules, then if the umpires start paying every free kick, they're, they're the ones that are going to cop the criticism, ironically. So it's best to play like that in most circumstances, particularly if you think you're already getting a bad deal from the umpires because there's a limit really to how much they can ping you every week. Absolutely. I think if you look at the, the premiership teams over the past, well, forever, basically, uh, try and find me a premiership team that wasn't physical and playing that, you know, mm-hmm. you know, uh, pushing the limit type of football. Yep. All right, well, let's get on to our preview. It's Port versus Hawthorne this Friday night. Friday night footy, you've got to love that. Um, at Etihad Stadium, we've got a 17-13 win-loss record. Um, obviously, last time we met was uh, in round four, when we won by eight points at Adelaide Oval. Uh, I guess the first question I've got is, what has changed for both clubs since round four? I think Not much has everything. changed. Though. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had in round four. That's really the thing, I think. I think they're much rolling along as they were and we sort of uh, had big plans for what our season was going to be that weren't really panning out. Oh, they were panning out then, but they didn't mm. pan out. It was a happy time back then, that's for sure. It was a happy time. <laughs> but, Definitely. Yeah. It was a, a good game to be at, that's for sure. It just, it just showed, I guess, the, the best football we can play and we haven't mm. really hit that level again for the rest of the year, I don't think. And that's probably as, as good a football as we can play that first you know quarter and a half or so. Mm. Um uh, I, I guess, I mean, as as Porsche said, there's not a lot different for um, for Hawthorne. They're just going about their business as they were. But obviously we're now um, got a very different team, lots of players out from that team. Um, we also have a lot less to play for, I guess. Uh, but then I guess, you know, do, how, how do our players react? And, you know, uh, we could really derail Hawthorne's season. If, if Hawthorne beat us, uh, they're getting a lot closer to that second position on the ladder and home finals. If we can knock them off, then it's looking like they'll have to travel to Perth at least once uh, to win the flag. So we could potentially stop them from winning another flag. So I'd hope, you know, I'd hope that's a little bit of uh, uh, motivation for us. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely crucial that, uh, that Hawthorne win this one. Yeah. All in the context of their season, they'll also probably want to be back back after that that first quarter last time around because that was so uncharacteristic of them and it sort of just showed that they can you know they can fall apart like that and I think they won't want to let that happen this time no that's right so I guess the the next question I've got is is this going to be a case of how far for Hawthorne or do we actually stand a legitimate chance of winning this I think we definitely have a chance of winning this one um absolutely why wouldn't we uh we've got the one thing I suppose that is different between Hawthorne and Port Adelaide is that we no longer have anything on the line, as it's been said, which can mean, first of all, it can mean a lack of motivation in terms of maybe coming back. 
but that's generally not a problem for us to at least have a crack at that. But certainly as far as just going out there and playing the best game that you can, um, that's our only motivation for this week. Uh, and we've got a few young blokes that will sort of certainly be trying to um, lead the way in that, with hopefully with uh, Brendan Archie following up last week. Um, and I think that even though Hawthorne did beat us in that final last year, I think we did enough to scare the crap out of them. And I think they'll take us reasonably seriously if we're getting close. So I think it'll be a good game. I think that when you have those really tight tussles, I think that we'll just see what our players are made of. And I think that they can be um, effective under high pressure. They have been in the past. So I think we've got a good game shaping up, quite honestly. And I think we can win. Yeah, I, I tend to agree. And I think the one thing Hawthorne don't do that every other team in the league does against us is go defensive. They are happy to back in their attacking game plan and uh, and just let us uh, let us play our game. And that's why we get, you know, massive runs of goals against them. Um, you know, with the team we've got, you, you wouldn't expect us to win. But uh, if we can catch them by surprise a bit, little bit and go on a couple of bursts, we're definitely capable of doing it. Uh, and, and they won't try and shut us down. They'll just play the same way and, and, and back themselves in as they always do. So, look, it'll, yeah, it'll, it'll take probably Ryder having a big game and our mids having a big game. Uh, but if we can get over them in the midfield uh, and just get a bit of run going, uh, get a bit of confidence, especially early on, we're a big chance, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, and psychologically going forward, it's probably important that we, we have a good game and don't get destroyed by them because... Next year, they're probably going to make... Well, they will make the finals again. We're hoping to make the finals, and we might have another finals game against them. So um, going toe-to-toe with them and, and really competing with them uh, over four quarters is important If we if for the next couple of times we have to play them, which could be really, really big games for us, hopefully. Yep. Um, I totally agree with all of that. Um, it's really just a matter of staying close, I suppose, and making it so that they would have to really work to put us away. Um because they're going to the finals and we're probably not. So they want to conserve energy. And that's the one thing that has kept Hawthorne near the top of the ladder um, most of years recently is that they have a, a very efficient game plan, not just in terms of execution, but also in energy spent. And so they will be wanting to do anything they possibly can to not have to work too hard this week. So that's the one area where we have got a small uh, way to get an edge and make them work. Yeah. Might as well talk about the teams. Uh, Hawthorne have dropped uh, Daniel Howe, so he's out of the team. They brought back Ryan Shinemakers, uh, possibly to play a forward. He's played up forward most of the season, and so they might try and stretch us. Uh, as we know, Jackson Trengove's out with his shoulder surgery. Uh, we've brought back Jay Schultz, which is fantastic. Um, so I guess the next question I've got is, are we surprised that A, Loby didn't come straight back in, and B, Cleary didn't come in for Trengo? Yes, uh, on both counts. <laughs> mm. Yes, I'm surprised. I'm not surprised by the query one um, because we're playing against, I suppose, one of the most experienced teams in the league, realistically, uh, as far as finals experience and important big game experience. And uh, I think that if we, we... We can cover their tools with the defenders we already have, but adding a, a an extra... I suppose basically a junior tall defender into what's going to be a really crunch game. It's a make or break thing, and um, I can see why he might have been excluded. But Matt Lobby, um, yeah, are we really worried about Hawthorne's ruck dominance too much, really? Like, I don't think that's the key to their game uh, necessarily against us this week. Um, and so I can see why they might leave Lobby out. Um, but I think wasn't there talk about Lobby having some sort of injury anyway, so maybe it's just the keeping him trying to recover, same as they're doing with Drengo. Yeah. yeah, I mean, for, for me, I'm pretty surprised that Loeb didn't come back in, simply for the fact that he had such a great game in the SNFL last week. I thought they would just uh, immediately bring him back in. Um, as for Cleary, I'm not sure I agree with your point there, Porsche, considering we're likely to be playing Johnny Butcher down back, who's played all of about three and a half games of defensive football in his life. So uh, that, that might be a bit of an odd one. Um, it's going to be interesting, I guess, the defensive matchups. I'm probably expecting Hobbs to go to Roughhead, uh, maybe Jonas to go to Gunston, and you would think if we are going to play Butcher down back, he'll get uh, David Hale. I don't think yeah. we will. I think we're going to play West off back and play Butcher forward again. Yeah, yeah we'll play West off back. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I think maybe Butcher and West off will switch. I'd back. see us doing the Butcher back. Against Hawthorne, it's, I mean, maybe against GWS or something, but Hawthorne, they're just too experienced and outfit to risk it. 
uh, you'd have yeah. Cleary over him every day in defence. Yeah, Phil. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I agree that the addition of Cleary pretty much indicates that we're not playing Butcher in defence, in my view. So I think that's why, you know, I think yeah. there's no chance of him playing in defence because I don't think he knows the defensive patterns well enough and I don't think he's got the awareness that he's needed to do that. No, I, well, I tend to agree. I, and that's probably why I was shocked that Cleary wasn't picked because, A, I mean, yes, I, I get that he's inexperienced and we're playing a very good team, but I don't think he's put too many, you know, his foot wrong too many times. Um, there's, a, you know, the game before he got dropped, he was our best tall defender and, and there's showed a lot of good signs in there pretty much every time he's been given opportunity. So um, I, I would have thought he'd come in on the back of that with uh, with Trengove going out, but clearly we've got different ideas and I, I suspect that Westhoff and... Uh, Westhoff and Butcher will switch back. Uh, I would hope that Westhoff plays back for most of that, um, just because personally I want to see Butcher up forward and I want to see what that does to our, uh, our I guess, forward entry. Um, but I think we can cover them if we if we don't get absolutely pants in the midfield. Uh, I think we can cover their their forwards. Uh, they're obviously going to do very well if they beat us in the midfield because they're all very good players and uh, that's why they're all you know two time reigning premiers. Does their pace up forward worry you guys at all? I mean, uh, for me, I think Hawthorne have probably the best small forward combination in the game. They've kicked over 100 goals between them this year. I mean, Rioli's probably going to be All-Australian. Um, Bruce kicks a hell of a lot of goals. He's their leading goal scorer this year, and Popolo um, is always sort of dangerous as well. I think it's arguable that um, the fact that we are have, excluding Trengo and not replacing him with a key defender shows how seriously we take their small forward line. Um, and as you might have noticed, I mean, Cam O'Shea, Jasper Pitta, Matthew Broadbent are all still playing this week, and Nathan Cracker. Um, yep. I think that there's pretty definite that we're going to be trying to play pretty much the same way we did last week with the extreme slingshot uh, method, and uh, it might be the other way around as far as who's attacking um, this time. Maybe it'll be the smalls that'll be doing the real shutdown jobs, and the expecting guys like um, Pomch particularly to be leading our defence with uh, repelling up to the forward line. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think it's all about the, the battle in the middle. If they get clean entry into their forward line, we're going to get absolutely murdered, basically. Mm. Uh, we need to put a lot of pressure on that ball. Uh, and the last few times we've played them, we've been able to do that pretty well. Uh, so, you know, whether we can do it with, uh, you know, I guess, less, you know, not, not our best side, and, you know, missing uh, two most experienced key tolls and that sort of thing. Uh, that might be that, you know, guys like Roughhead and Gunston, if they can't take the mark, can bring the ball to ground and, uh, it's not looking like a great matchup on uh, for us experience wise, but if we can stop the ball coming in, then we can slingshot the ball out. And given that they won't go defensive, I think we can be really effective with that slingshot. Uh, if if Pitt and Broadbent get on top, so um, yeah, yeah but it'll be interesting to see. Uh, but hopefully, we can just stop them from getting a lot of easy kicks into the forward line. Yeah. Yeah. So who goes to Rioli? I mean, my heart says. Oh, sorry, my head says probably Nathan Cracker. I think he's probably a, a pretty good matchup for him. Whether he's got the fitness to go with him all game, I'm not too sure. But my heart says Impey. I'd love to see Jarman Impey go to uh, Cyril Rioli and just say, hey, here's your chance. Let's see what you can do on him. Yeah, um, I think it'd be really great. And it's certainly the sort of work he's done before. Um yeah, yeah, Jam- and Jamin Inky would probably be my first choice, but it'd be interesting to see what someone like Brendan Archie would do, just sort of playing against him and following his position. I don't know about that. And Archie's more of an attacking sort of minded midfielder. I, I don't know. I wouldn't say I'd put him in the back pocket with Cyril. Aww. Yeah, I'd like to see Inky on him. That'd be pretty yeah. exciting. Um, mm. he tends to stick to the, the small forwards like Glue, uh, especially the fast ones, he's going to really keep up. So I'm looking forward to that matchup. Mm. Yeah, I'm. I'm really hoping that MP gets him as well. Just, I mean, even if we get smashed, at least he, he spends, um, you know, four quarters playing on one of the better small forwards in the game, and, and that's what we drafted him for, and that's what we want him to do. And he's done some really good jobs in that small forward, uh, sorry, small defender role. Um, he's had some off games playing it as well. So the more experience we can give him against top quality forwards, the better. So I'd hope he gets uh, gets through uh, most of the game, as that's really the most obvious matchup. Yeah, I mean, this is his chance to play on the second best small forward in the league. So I think it's an important opportunity for him to to really step up to the plate and, and show us what he can do. Um, he hasn't really sort of done those sort of roles for us this year. Uh, he certainly did last year, but this year he's sort of, I don't know, he hasn't really had a, a set role in the side. So it'll be interesting to see how he goes on Rioli. Um, what about Bruce? I mean, he's someone that probably plays taller than he is. He's got good pace, great goal sense. Um, do you put Pittard on him? 
and hope that Pittard doesn't sort of stuff up, or maybe O'Shea, or is that someone that Impey can go to if uh, if Cracker doesn't go to Rioli? I think that that's probably a better fit for Impey, actually, than most of the other defenders that we have. And Rioli, mostly is smarts you need to look out for, so we probably want someone that's particularly astute there. Um, and as much as he can be hit and miss, Pittard maybe back on the um, Rioli matchup, but... Yeah, I think Impey's probably the best matchup for Bruce, no doubt, because I think he's got enough skill to sort of not only be heavily accountable, but also bring it back the other way as well. Yeah. Yeah. I tend to agree. It'll be interesting to see how we set that up. And uh, obviously, you know, guys like Jonas and O'Shea might occasionally play small, but you'd expect them to probably have to play pretty tall for most mm-hmm. of the game, given the, the tall back line we've gone in with. So, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see who we rotate through. Yeah. I think O'Shea to Bruce would be the one. Um, I reckon Bruce is a bit more of a... He's not like a uh, ball on the deck, sort of small forward like Cyril where he can pounce and he's pretty opportunistic. I think Bruce is more of a sort of lead-up small forward. Yeah. Um, but so I think we'll put O'Shea to him. I think that's kind of the way I'd put Impy on him, though, because he isn't that ground-level guy, so that means that if he can just force a contest and bring it to ground, then he's got the advantage in repelling. Um, we want to get yeah. wins in these matchups, not just sort of make an even... <coughs> yeah, that's yeah. a good call. Definitely, uh, once the ball hits the ground, you'd, you'd say Impy's got the advantage. Mm. I mean, if Impy doesn't go to Rioli, for me, I'd prefer him to go to Brad Hill, to be honest. Because I, I think, for me, I'd love to see Impy turn into that sort of outside running, you know, creative, super quick uh, midfielder that Brad Hill um, does the same sort of job for Hawthorne. Absolutely showed a bit of that last weekend as well. So, yeah, it's not too bad a call. Yeah. He's hitting some yeah. good inside 50s last week, actually, on the wing. Yeah. That he did. <laughs> well, we've spoken about... So, uh, Johnny Wolf Butcher, how, how do we feel about Johnny Butcher? <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Butcher, right? <laughs> well, let's talk about Johnny Butcher a bit more, because I think uh, he deserves a bit of a talk. Um, how did you guys see him go last week? I want to hear from Scorcho first. How did you see him play last week? Oh, I think he just uh, he did exactly what I've been arguing that he'd do, and you know he got the the pretty standard uh, twenty five game key forward stat line of one goal, nine touches, and three marks. But he just straightened us up so much. Uh, we just kicked to that hot spot, and you know he he did. He crashed some packs. He, he brought the ball to ground when you know usually you'd see one of the players wrestling Schultz out and the other one taking an uncontested mark. He just seemed to create a bit of, a bit of havoc in there, and our other forwards really seemed to play off him well. Um, we didn't seem to be directing. Uh, our our um our forward entries to the pockets like we have very frustratingly all year. Uh, personally, he probably could have held a few marks uh, that, that he dropped, and he I mean you know, it'd be nice if he could have nailed two of those shots instead of one, uh, two of the three he had. But uh, I think ultimately if we leave him in and, and play him in that role, he'll he'll do better and better as we go on in terms of holding marks and and you know timing his runs and you know learning who kicks when and you know just just kind of uh, gelling with the other forwards and the midfielders kicking the ball in. So I think for a first gamer, he, he presented really well. And I think our structure was much better for having that um, high marking um, kind of forward who can, who can get under a, or get on top of a pack and, and cause a bit of havoc, cause a bit of havoc and bring the ball to ground. Yeah. I pretty much. Yeah, those thoughts. Um, been a lot of discussion about it on the forums. I think everyone seems to be happy with the way he went. Um, and his work rate was pretty impressive as well. Um, I think he did more than what Schultz does when he gets up the ground. Like he actually sort of got involved in the play a bit more, um, where where Schultz would just lead up and he'd sort of just be floating on the wing, and then he just sort of he wouldn't really be involved. I think Butcher sort of they used him a bit more. He didn't get a lot of the ball, but he was there, which was exciting. So if we can just leave him forward again this week, and he can put in a similar performance, I'll be happy. If we play him back, uh, I'll probably be disappointing. Um, because he's not really a backman, is he? I don't really want to say that. No. His right. future is as a forward, or is, there's no future at all for mine. I kind of feel like Butcher's performance last week, um, and it's, I suppose, I don't know if it's a role going forward, but he's a really good shock tactic because he plays so differently to, I suppose, a conventional Ashall key forward. Um, and I can see that there might be some value in that against <laughs> who are designed to grind up conventional key forwards. Um, I think that, that going back a few years now, the North Melbourne weakness was always unconventional forward setups, um, and because they were so structured around playing against a certain type of side, 
and obviously Hawthorne play against sides playing at their best pretty much every week, or at least trying to. Um, so having something a bit random up there, I guess that could be a good thing for us. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm just not sold uh, as an actual long-term role, which I'm afraid. Yeah, I was just going to add that it's probably more conventional than Jay Schultz, who just leads to the pocket, leads to the pocket, leads to the pocket. Um, I think having just a old-fashioned pack crash at key forward like Johnny Butcher is a bit actually more standard. Just wanted to add that in. Yeah. What do you mean by standard? Do you mean standard as in there is a lot of precedent for it, or do you mean standard as in there's lots of them at every team? Because I think there's definitely a lot more people leading to the pockets than there are John Butchers. Yeah, I guess that's fair enough. I was thinking more conventional as in traditional. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's what we're talking about. I, I think he, he probably offers something that, um, as word. I said, that uh, offers something. Schultz is a very lead, you know, he takes the ball, um, you know, as it hits the ground almost from a bad kick. Uh, you know, he's not that great above his head uh, unless he's one-on-one with someone who he's as strong as, then he's quite clever. Uh, and he, or, or, if he's, uh, or he's sitting on someone's shoulders, basically. But he's not great in a, in a pack-type situation. And I guess, um, you know, we, we, we sort of recruited Ryder to have that taller pack-marking type player because I guess Westhoff's tall, but he's not really the same either. He doesn't have the body size, or, or although I think he's probably heavier than Butcher, but I guess he just doesn't attack the ball the same way. Um, you know, we, we talked about Charlie Dixon. If we can get Dixon, that's exactly, you know, that's, Pretty much where I, you know, in my in my head, butcher could go, you know. Uh, yeah. So you know, we, we, we I, I really enjoyed watching us have that kind of player who, you know, if he was two on one, that wasn't necessarily that didn't necessarily mean he was going to be held out and have the other one take an uncontested mark as we see so often. Um, two on one meant he was probably going to you know drive through two of them and get at least get his hands to the ball. Um, and when we've got such clever small forwards in in you know uh, Wingard and and Monfries and uh, Robbie when he's up there. Uh, we can really benefit from that. So uh, I'd like to at least see him played in that role, hopefully for the last few games, and just see how it changes our structure and see how it changes how we play because it's definitely a, a very different, as Porsche says, it's very unusual for our team especially, but maybe for the AFL. Um, and and hopefully it can actually, uh, I guess, change the way we play and you know, straighten us up a lot more and, and assist in the way we want to play. All right. Well, back to Hawthorne. And we'll talk about their midfield. As we've mentioned, it's uh, it's one of the best midfields in the competition. They've got a lot of wise heads through there. They're great at the stoppages. They win a lot of clearances. Uh, they're also super quick. Uh, where are we going to get an advantage over the Hawks' midfield? I'm really not sure at all, to be honest. <laughs> Patrick Ryder is going to be our advantage, uh, outrucking Ben McAvoy. Um, yep. It was really novel last week just not having a Ruckman, a Port Ruckman tapping it down the throat of the opposition player over and over again, as loby has been doing. loby has been winning a lot of hitouts all year, but how many times he's just tapped it straight to a wide open opposition player who then waltzes it out has been very yeah. frustrating. So I think Ryder was a lot better competitively in that sense. And, you know, the Hawks, uh, all through their good run, have never really had a, a dominant Ruckman. And they, they recruited McAvoy, who is really good around the ground, but isn't a dominant tap Ruckman. So that's that's somewhere where we've got a huge advantage. I really hope uh, the likes of Boke, Gray, um, Archie, even Sam, uh, Sam Gray, I, I hope they're switched on to Ryder this week. And if, if he can get us first use of the ball, uh, Hawthorne will be expecting to be winning the clearances. And they'll be, they'll be setting up expecting... Uh, standing, you know, front side, expecting to be able to waltz out uh, and and get a good score on the board early on. If we can really dominate those clearances early on, uh, on the back of Ryder having a big game, uh, we're a big chance. I think yeah. I agree, hundred percent. Yeah. I think the main problem there, Scorcho, is the fact that, as you just said, Hawthorne have been playing all year with a losing ruck, and so if Ryder, even if Ryder is quite good, they're probably expecting him to win, so they'll be just yeah. accordingly. Mm. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, oh well, yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I just, and it's so tough to know what we'll do because we haven't played a lot of full games with the rider and the ruck with the the sort of setups we've got at the moment. Um, there's a lot of unknown quantities, I guess. Uh, Sam Gray actually being played as a midfielder, Archie playing a full game. Um, yeah, wh- whether we're able to counter it, I, I hope we are. But I, I I agree with what you're saying. That's a good point. Yeah, I think the real thing that's going to come down to it's not necessarily just Ryder winning the tap and getting it to a person, but just that communication that he might have with our midfield. Um, that's going to be the thing that can get us an edge because while I just said, yeah, okay, Hawthorne is to, um, going to a losing ruck, 
um, if we know the play and they don't necessarily, then that gives us that split second edge that we can actually exploit. But if we don't have a good relationship with the writer and the midfielders, I don't know. So I suppose if we do get on top of midfield, we'll know how good that relationship actually currently is. Absolutely. That's a yeah, good point. It'd be, it'd be really interesting to see how we're able to go. Mm. That's it. Uh, who goes on their outside runners in uh, Smith and Hill? Obviously, I've mentioned that um, I wouldn't mind seeing Impey run with uh, Hill at some point during the game. Um, I think stopping these guys' run will be the key to us winning. Um, between them, they average 44 touches, nine inside 50s, a few bounces, a couple of goal assists and 1.5 goals a game. So they're probably the most damaging outside combination in the game. Um, mm. Who goes to Smith? Is that a job for Ebert, maybe, with his, uh, yep. with his fitness and, and gut running capabilities? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I was going to suggest Ebert. Yeah, we we need players who can hurt him the other way, and Ebert definitely, if he sorts his kicking out, uh, is is someone who's got that advantage. He'll out Mark Smith every time. Uh, so if he can stick with Smith and then intercept a lot of the passes that are going to him and just just hassle him all day and then hurt him the other way, um, that will go a long way to us winning. We've got to we've got to hurt those guys the other way. We can't just try and stop them. We've got to make them accountable. I reckon. Yeah. I'd also give some points there. Smith's kicked uh, seven goals in the last four games against Port Adelaide, so he does often hit the scoreboard. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's why, I mean, I just said O'Shea, but it could be cracker, but I think that obviously our um, half backs are just as likely to be playing time on him as well, depending on how we man up. Um, so I think any of them can probably match up the, with that. They'll be running the other way. Um, whether they'll actually be accountable, I don't know whether they necessarily need to be accountable all that much. I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, I guess that is the first choice you mentioned with uh, Ebert, really. Yeah. Here's a question for you. What is, because I know he's still in, what is Kane Mitchell's role in the side this week? Like, what's he going to be doing? Because I don't know. Mascot. <laughs> I, I actually think this is a game where Kane Mitchell can be valuable. Um, mm. And as, as I said earlier, uh, Hawthorne aren't going to plug four guys behind the ball and just defend doggedly and beat us 60 to 40. It won't happen. Uh, they're either going to smash us or we're gonna, they're going to lose in a pretty high-scoring game. Um, so I, given that they won't set up, they'll, they'll set up assuming they're going to beat us and they'll back themselves in to do so. Uh, Kane Mitchell's running power on the slingshot uh, could actually be pretty valuable. Um, it's just a matter of us being able to, to win the ball in defense and get it back out over the top. And that's where the likes of Ebert and, and Mitchell might actually, and White, I guess, might be valuable. So uh, I would say with Mitchell, he's not a lot of good when we're up against it. He's great when we're, we're running free. And Hawthorne, compared to other teams that usually beat us, um, and I guess they don't really usually beat us, do they? It's, it's about 50-50. But other teams we might struggle against. Hawthorne aren't going to go super defensive to, to just know they can knock us off. They'll be priming themselves for the finals, and, and I don't think they'll want to be in a dogged defensive uh, kind of street fight at this point of the season. So I'd expect a pretty free-running game, especially at Eddie had. So I'd hope that Kane Mitchell can play a, a, a good high-level high Kane Mitchell game. But, yeah, we'll see. That's me being very hopeful, I think. I actually think he's going to be the most natural, um, the natural selection for sub. I think looking at the squad, looking at the side, I think um, given the, I think Cracker was sub last week. I think he'll probably play a full game this week. I think it's down to either Mitchell or Sammy Gray, to be honest, for the sub. I yeah. reckon Sammy Gray is going to go this week against an actual, you know, probably good midfield. It's been all right the last few weeks, actually. It's- Sort of proven me wrong. He's played three bit. three really good games in a row, so I think he's hopefully going to continue that and um, you know get off the leash a little bit. And um, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to see what sort of role he's going to do. I don't think he's going to do any sort of defensive role. I think his job's just to try and win the ball at the stoppages and get it forward as quick as possible. Yeah, absolutely. It's, if it's he does that, I think he'll be is... playing pretty well. Yeah, it's nice to see him play his natural role. And uh, obviously, we chucked him forward for a lot of the start of his career, but he's a sentiment, and that's what he plays at SNFL level. So it's nice to see, see him given a chance to be a, a sentiment at, uh, at AFL level and be a midfielder and, and play that role. And he's done pretty well, you know. Uh, I, I think I'd said I wouldn't be picking him, but now that he's been picked, he's made himself really hard to drop, and that's all you can really ask from a guy, I guess, of his talent and stature and that sort of thing. He's just playing really good, solid footy, so you just hope for the same sort of thing from him again. Uh, don't be anonymous. Get involved in the play. Uh, work hard. Hopefully uh, get on the end of a few clearances and get the ball forward. Being Sammy Gray might have its advantages this week because I think if he does play in the midfield... I really can't see guys like Luke Hodge or Jordan Lewis paying him much attention at all. 
Yeah, I suppose that we do talk about Hawthorne's arrogance occasionally, and I suppose ignoring someone like Sam Gray is exactly what they might do. So, yeah, good call. But is it that damaging in the first place to even, like, it's not really a big deal? Uh, <laughs> he gets a bit of a beast. He's like, a, he's like an elite kick or anything. I think that um, the reason why threads like uh, Spuds Who Tear Us Apart exist is because in any set of matchups, there's always someone that you allow to go free, um, and sometimes you get that wrong. And so it might not necessarily be that he has to fight against, you know, obviously the sort of tagging job that both gets, but that he is given a low enough priority that he has a chance to be a bit of a surprise packet. So that's, I suppose, what you'd be hoping for. Yeah, and you think at, at his absolute yeah. best, at his absolute best, he he can be a damaging player. Um, not not he's not going to be damaging consistently for four quarters, but he doesn't have to be. He just needs to get on the end of it, get into, involved in a few one twos, and help release the other guys who are better kicks. And and when he does have his chance to do something, do it well. Um, and he doesn't have to doesn't have to do anything ridiculous. He just needs to play within his limitations, but uh, execute. Uh, and that's been a big part of our issue this year is we just don't execute. So if he executes uh, and we're getting a bit of a run on, um, all of a sudden I've got to worry about this little guy who they've never heard of, um, yeah. who's about, you know, uh, four foot tall. Uh, and they're, they're looking at, oh, who do we chuck on this guy? And then all of a sudden uh, we might, with a few chess moves, might be able to release another another midfielder for a little bit. So mm-hmm. he's just going to take his chances when he gets it. It's a bit like uh, when I play social basketball, I'm the worst basketballer in the world. But if I nail my first two <laughs> shots... I nail my first two shots. All of a sudden, they're, they're man marking me, and yeah. it's just hilarious. And I, I don't have to make another shot all game, but they're, they're worried about me. And, and he might be a bit the same in this sense. He just needs to take his chances when he gets them. Yep. Brennan Archie, can he back it up this week? Yes, yeah, he absolutely can. We just need to give him a full game and tell him to do the same job. He he slotted into that wines role uh, very seamlessly mm. uh, last week, which yep. is exactly what we want from a big bodied midfielder. Take note. Um, well, it won't really matter, I guess, for Andrew Moore because he's probably going to get delisted and never play AFL again. But um, if he does get another opportunity at AFL, cool. then take note, take your opportunities because that's what we're looking for. You know, get, he, he got into the game. He was really confident. He threw his weight around a little bit, and when he got his opportunity, he, he took it um, and had a really consistent game. So uh, I don't know whether it's just you know mentality or attitude or, or what, but you know, from a guy who was almost delisted a couple of years ago to be playing that sort of footy, uh, is brilliant. So you'd really hope he can back it up and start to build some yeah. consistency. I think that, He's that, that way, I think that Brendan Archie's performance, not necessarily saying it's going to cause it, but um, I think that his top end performance this week, uh, he's going to be playing what Friday Night Football as a sort of a known player this week against the top more the, the reigning premiers. Um, he's going to be extremely full of nerves, and this is one of the cases where you can definitely say that you definitely want your teammates around him as soon as he does something good in the first quarter and just sort of, yeah, good on you, got it, you know, whatever else, just to give him that confidence because he's probably going to be a bit uh, uh, startled, I would say, uh, and we'll see how that goes. But, uh, yeah, this yeah. is the big stage now, absolutely. Good I'd like to see him follow uh, Jordan Lewis around and say, just watch him learn and, and see what he does because I, I see him really sort of turning into that sort of player. I think he's got the potential to turn into that sort of player, I should say. Yeah, that's great. It's a bit harsh on uh, Jordan Lewis. I think he's pretty good already. I don't think he needs to aspire to be uh, <laughs> aspire to be uh, Brendan Archie. Although, although if he, if he plays, I mean, yeah, that's three Brownlow votes from Archie last week. So, um, yeah, maybe maybe Lewis will be following him around. Hopefully. That's it. All right, prediction time. Who's going to win? Uh... Uh, I'm going to say. Um... It's really depressing that I'm going to go to a game I'm going to tip against Port. I'm going to tip against Port, and it's going to be probably walked on by about, well, let's say, 15. Uh, Dylan, your, your pick? Uh, since I'll be there, uh, like Porsche, I think I'll actually go for a bit of optimism and say that we'll get up by four goals for the, a blistering Ooh. quarter somewhere somewhere in there, maybe the first quarter again. I don't know. I'm hoping we do turn it on, though. We have to. The, yeah. the rest of the Melbourne games, bar North Melbourne, have been... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I think we'll stick with them. We'll have some patches where we'll, we'll look really good, but we'll have some patches where they'll just uh, get goal after goal after goal as well. So uh, the head says we'll, we'll stick with them all right, and then probably they'll kick away a bit in the in the third and the last, and maybe win by five or six. Uh, the heart says we uh, blitz them in, in one of our good patches and can hang on by 10 points. I like it. I'm going to say Hawthorne by 72 points and Johnny Butcher <laughs> kicking three goals. Hey, 
I, I that would be. <laughs> we'll take it. <laughs> I, I oh, it'd be a bit like that the, the Bulldogs game where he kicked six, wouldn't it? If if we're if we're down and out early, all I'll be looking for is butcher goals. If if we're five goals down at quarter time and we're pretty the game's over, um, I will just be wanting us to kick it to Butch. <laughs> yeah. If Butch plays down back, I'm going to say David Hale's gonna get a dozen. <laughs> okay. That's probably... yeah. Cheer, cheer the black and the white on the magpies day and by night. Well, let's talk uh, a brief chat about uh, the SNFL game. Port play South Adelaide at uh, Albert and Oval on Saturday. Uh, three changes. Uh, Sammy Cahoon, Jared Redden and Mason Shaw come into the site. Um, I guess the question I've got is, uh, where is Mason Shaw at? Does he really need to pull something out of the bag in the next few weeks? Are you saying he's in danger of being delisted? I think he might be in danger of being delisted. Mm. The emergence of Gray in the AFL, yeah, it's probably not too easy to nail on the delisting, so he could be up for it. But I think by virtue of him being a key forward, he will stay on another year. Well, we gave longer to um, Brendan RT than we've given to Shaw so far, if I'm pretty sure. So I, I think that yeah. uh, it's not uncommon. Okay, I'll explain my view on this quickly. Uh, I'll try not to make it long. Jason Cripps, he is, had, I think he had the longest time of any NFL player to get to 100 games while still being on a, a senior list. And I think that certainly there's been a trend at Port Adelaide for a long time now to really just hang on to players and develop and develop and develop. And I see no reason why Mason Shaw would not still be on that list of people that you give a go. I think the recent success, very recent success, obviously, of Brendan Archie is sort of endorsing that view of list management. And I don't see why... And John Butcher. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. Well, John Butcher's not really showing that, I don't think, but... Um, I think that there's no reason to believe that we're going to change tack based on the success of Brendan Archie and the uh, perceived success of John Butcher by some people. Um, I think that he's probably pretty safe, I would have thought. I I tend to agree. I just think you don't you don't delist or get rid of talented key forwards uh, until they've shown that they haven't got it. Um, and, you know, he, he's had some injury issues. He's also shown some stuff. Uh you know, pretty much the same argument I've been making with Butcher. I, I, and I was making with Butcher a couple of years ago. I'll apply to Shaw. He's had some injury interruptions. He has. He's also shown enough to me to say that he has potential. Uh, he he is built like I guess an AFL, a modern AFL key forward. Um, and it'd just be crazy to delist him now. I think he'd definitely get picked up somewhere else. No doubt he'd go back to, to Frio in a second. Wouldn't mm. he? Wouldn't he like, you know, and, and when you think if a player's going to be picked up that quickly, why would you get rid of him? So we may have some issues when we come down to it about who we're delisting, but I don't think you delist key forwards with, you know, uh, as I, you know, beat my head against the wall on the forums, we we haven't to develop them. We've got to make sure we, we hang on to these guys and, and give them every opportunity to be good AFL players. Uh, and, yeah, Shaw is just as, as much a part of that as, as Butcher and Harvey. Yep. I think it just comes down to a pure numbers situation. Uh, we, we need to find a couple of more people to the list, I think. You know, we, obviously, Corns is probably going now. You know, Johnny Butcher, who two weeks ago looked like an absolute certainty to get delisted, he may not get delisted. So, I don't know. I, I don't think we're going to be keeping both Shaw and Butcher. I think it's going to be probably one's going to stay and one's going to go. I well, who do you think... think has more of a future, Harvey or Shaw? Oh, Harvey. They they've probably shown about as much from what I've been reading. I think, I think Harvey's That's shown more. Problem. I've been pretty disappointed in Shaw. I think he needs to get his head in the game a little bit more. He, need, he just needs to pull something out of the bag in the next few weeks to say, hey, I've got a bit of a future at AFL level. You need to keep me on the list, I think. I think Harvey's consistency has been very good this year. Um, I think Shaw physically is probably the better player. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's a tough one. I don't think we're going to be That's keeping right. both Butcher and Shaw. Um, especially with Harvey there, especially if we're going to be getting Charlie Dixon as well, uh, then one of them's going to have to make way. If we're getting Charlie Dixon, that changes everything. But if we don't yeah. have a traded people... Yeah, if we're getting Dixon, I feel like Shields probably on the way out as well. Yeah. Um, That's just I, I think, I think if, we're, if we're getting rid of Dixon, we should be looking to trade Shaw. I think he'd have... We, you know, we might get a third rounder for him from someone like... Uh, from Fremantle or something like that, given that he's Western Australian. And they're always looking for tolls. Uh, they seem to be linked to every toll in the league. Um, yeah, I, I think potentially Shaw even has a, a small amount of trade value at this point in his in his career. Um, if we get Dixon, obviously that changes everything, and we probably can't be carrying that many key forwards on the list uh, unless we're considering John Butcher to be a key defender. That is, <laughs> um, <laughs> but 
yeah, yeah, just assuming that we don't get Dixon for whatever reason. I, I, I can definitely find three players I'd rather do list than Mason Shaw. Yeah, easily. Um, given that Corns has gone already, we only need two more. Uh, I, I uh, alluded to one earlier. Uh, Andrew Moore has been well and truly overtaken by um, by Archie that quickly. Um, you know, the likes of O'Shea could go. <laughs> they wouldn't, oh. you know. Oh, sorry, I forgot who I was on the po- uh, podcast with. I'll take all that. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> um, funny one to pick out of that one. Uh, what, Paul Stewart or... Uh, oh, sorry, Paul Stewart. Paul Stewart's the very Brisbane. obvious one. Yeah, or Paul Stewart who came in. Who, not, uh, uh, Paul Stewart who came in for six games this year. I'll just remind everyone, go back to Butcher. Butcher has never played six games in a row. He's only ever played five. Paul Stewart came in for six games this year. Can anyone remember him doing anything at any point? Because I can't. Um, but he played as like a marking forward, so yeah. it was a yeah. pretty disgusting six weeks six weeks of selection. But uh, you know, the, Stewart's the, probably the first the first to be delisted after. Mm. Uh, Corners, but, it, I guess. but he's a great bloke, so yeah, oh, well, he's a nice guy. His best mates with Paul Bloke and Gray, isn't he? So ah, look, he's an attractive fella, and he's got a good man bun, or at least he had a good man bun. So you got to keep him a on good the list man bun. Is that an oxymoron? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, look, I, yeah, I, and if we get Dixon, it change, everything changes in terms of our key forwards. I think maybe then one has to go. Uh, who that ends up being, I don't know. It'll be most likely Shaw or Butcher. Um, but I would be hoping we'd, we'd at least try and get some offers to trade Shaw, even if it's just for a third rounder. I'd be surprised if Frio didn't have a look at him. Because I would definitely I'd, stick him I'd keep, him. I'd keep Butcher ahead of Shaw because, I mean, exactly. you'll get that, like, Kate. I think you're more likely to get KPF, traded. Um, depth chart and games played. Yeah. If we were to get rid of Schultz and bring in Dixon, then it'll be Dixon who hasn't played more than 12 games in a year. Yep. Uh, Johnny Butcher who's played 25 games. Westhoff who's barely a key forward. He's just really tall. Who are you, so, yeah, Porsche, who are you so saying you're going to trade? I think we'll be hanging on to Butcher. Um, if, sorry, if you're going to trade um, like, and say, oh, it's Butcher or Shaw... I think the reality is that the fact that Mason Shaw hasn't had any AFL experience uh, and has had a lot of injury problems, I mean, I don't think anyone's going to get a third round for that. You might get fourth or fifth, like, you know, the token ones. Um, if he moved on, uh, it would be far more likely in my mind that Freya said, oh, look, we'll give you a go, and it would be one of those really token little bullshit, you know, two draft picks in the fifth round sort of trades rather than one getting us anything of value. Um, yeah. Whereas Butcher we might still have enough cred on his name to be able to flog him off to someone shit in Melbourne. Um, like Melbourne, uh, <laughs> it's got to be, there's got to be a possibility there. So I think he's more likely yeah. to get some value because he was a first rounder, and I mean, most surely he was second or third, wasn't he? So you know, there's, there's a little bit more prestige for the over. I still hold out hope for sure. I, I really like his days. physicality. I like his ability to take a contested grab, and his kicking is beautiful to watch. But he just needs to get a kick, basically. So if it came down to it for me, I'd probably. Keep Mason Shaw over Johnny Butcher. Sorry, Scorch. But... <laughs> yeah. So to show, to show him the next five days, or the last five days of the Butcher thread, and that, that'll get us a first rounder every day. Because the optimism has <laughs> been fucking. <laughs> I have uh, yeah, been reveling in that a little bit. It's been good to see so many people positive, even people who were previously uh, negative about him and assuming he would go go back. But I think it was at, it was at Roman uh, on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. Maka said that he'd be, he wouldn't be surprised if Butcher kept his spot on the list. And this was before oh. he was getting picked. And we're all uh, he's looking like a genius now. He is looking like an absolute genius because even you know the, the biggest <laughs> uh, John Butcher fan on the forums, I couldn't see him keeping his spot at that point. Uh, but yeah, look, hey, if he, he plays another few games like he did there, I think he's a big chance. So we'll have to see. Ho- I mean, hopefully we get Dixon, and it's just a good problem to have, isn't it? Someone has to go. It is. Um, yeah. You know, whether we we, we, well, we do some creative trading and packaging with someone else or something like that. Um, but yeah, it'll be a good problem to have. Uh, very unusually for us to have too many key forwards. Uh. Mm. I don't. Oh, look, okay, I might be on key forwards. Is still that until you have. Uh... A first and a second key forward that are genuine key forwards. You don't have too many key forwards. Um, well, I'd say we don't have two genuine key forwards on our list. So we don't have too many key forwards. So no, that's right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great call. Great call. <laughs> we definitely play. We don't play a genuine key forward 
I don't think, like not a, you know not where you would like an archetypal type AFL modern key forward on our in our regular twenty two because Westhoff and Schultz aren't uh, and Wright is really a ruckman. Uh, he's got that potential to be that you know two hundred centimeter type key forward uh, that is is the norm these days, but he's not quite there yet, and we need him in the ruck because Lobie's palming it down the the throat of opposition players over and over again. So. All right. Well, I guess the next key thing to talk about is the James Hurd saga. He finally got <laughs> sacked. About time. Um, how do we feel about that? It seemed like a pretty obvious thing. Probably a little bit surprised that it happened now instead of at the end of the season. I've got to it say, a bit it obvious was... two and a half years ago. <laughs> <laughs> if I was an Essendon fan, I would be really shitty about this because the time to sack him was, in, in fact, two and a half years ago before every Essendon fan in Australia had committed to, no, we're sticking by herd, we're sticking by herd, and had to hold it for multiple years. Now they just look like they're... I, I was really frustrated just having to back this complete, you know, shit talker for years and years, and suddenly, oh, he's gone the now. cognitive dissonance Why is unreal. Yeah. yeah. Great but, call. I think probably... What a waste of a hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I think my biggest issue for that is who, who would take that job now? You've got potentially, or, oh. you know, it, it's a poison list anyway, and that's without, you know, assuming they don't lose all their players for a couple of years. Um, it's just, you know, it, two, two of the jobs up at the moment being Carlton and uh, Carlton and Essendon, they just both seem like the worst place you can go and make your name. It wouldn't shock me if it ended up being like an old, you know, an old player, like a bit of a, a bit like a Matty Primus for us kind of thing, where it's just someone who is just there to play the kids, turn the list over a little bit and, and, and set up for, you know, I guess, get them back to a position where they might look like an attractive option for a good coach again because... Yeah, there's always going to be somebody. Yeah, yeah. Well, someone will always put their there's hand only, There's only there. 18 jobs out there, and yeah. Essendon um, seem to have this unlimited amount of money they can pay coaches, so someone will... Someone will have a crack, and that's the thing. So I think you're going to see... Two, how bad it looks. Yeah, I think you're going to see two categories of coaches go for this job, um, and that's going to be... Um, Guys that are career coaches, so they maybe they want to be a head coach, but that maybe is not the whole reason why they're there. Like they maybe don't have that same fire that someone like Alistair Clarkson does, but they want to be an assistant or a football operations manager or something like that just until they retire and then until they die. Um, and then you might possibly get someone that is extremely ambitious that wants to know they will have time to develop or to, to reconstruct a club. And they're uncommon, they're hard to find. Um, so it's probably just going to be a career coach that will just do what he has to do to keep his job for as long as he can, which is great for everyone else that isn't Essendon because it means that they won't be winning premierships anytime soon. Yeah. I actually don't mind their list. I think they've got a, a reasonable list and they've got some decent kids coming through. But, I mean, who's going to take that job? I, I think, what, well, they've got like 20 players uncontracted at the moment. You know, Carlisle's pretty much walked out. Um, I mean, many other players might walk out as well. I mean, it's just going to be an absolute disaster. And especially still with Wada hanging over their head. I mean, it's it's a bit of a poison chalice at the moment. But it wouldn't surprise me if someone like Neil Craig actually takes it on. Yeah. Neil, maybe. <laughs> yeah, Mark Neil, yep. Yeah. yeah. Make it happen, please. Those like, presses. Uh, <laughs> the, nervous, the nervous twitches that he's going to have with Wada hanging over his head. I mean that's gonna be that's gonna be great to watch. In any it's in any other start sport, and in tears. Yeah. Oh, dear. In any other sport in the world, it'd be a really good job for a young up and coming manager because you or manager or coach, because you're not expected to be fantastic in your and, and yeah. dominate in your first uh, you know in your first coaching position. Uh, you know you see these these kind of jobs go to the young up and coming guys in say the English Premier League or the NFL, uh, and then they they seem to have learnt from their mistakes. But if you go to a club like where Essendon are now uh, in in the AFL, you just that's it, you're done. Oh, I didn't do well there, burned forever. And you know if you don't win a flag, you pretty much have to be a very good coach for a very long time to ever get even look in at another job. So. It's very difficult, I think. Very difficult for someone to make that decision. But as uh, as we've said, there's always going to be someone who's ambitious enough, and or, or someone who just yeah uh, wants a wants a crack at it. Yeah, I reckon the viciousness of our industry. Um, even if even if you've got the circumstances completely against you, and everyone knows that you're just not going to succeed. If you just keep playing trash for a year, you're going to be gone anyway, regardless of the circumstances, and just completely ripped apart by pundits 
and your career is basically over as a head coach. Yeah, but yeah. Like, I think that's what it comes down to is that if you don't really care too much about the head coach, you just want to be a career coach, you can always go back to being an assistant again afterwards like Mark Neal has shown. Um, yeah. And, you know, as Vossi's shown, as pretty much every senior coach has shown, except for the ones that have just basically lost their brains being a senior coach. Um, <laughs> so it'll, it'll be a caretaker coach for sure. Yeah. As I said, they've got a lot of great young kids like James Gould, Adam Cooney and uh, Sean McKernan. So, you know, that, that should be right for the future, I would think. <laughs> wow. no, I, do actually, <laughs> I do actually like their list. I mean, Danaher looks like a, he's going to be a wonderful player. Hurley's in All-Australian form. You know, Heppel's still young. Hibbard's still young. The Merritt brothers go all right. Uh, they found a decent player in Martin Gleeson this year. Um, Kyle Langford looks like a good uh, key forward for the future. Um, Sean Edwards could be anything. Same with Jaden Laverde. So they they got some decent kids there, but I don't know. Mate, I, I think they need to probably find someone. Um, it's certainly in the ruck. Maybe Lewenberg is going to go there. You never know. Um, and I guess the next thing to talk about, which is linked, is uh, Jake Carlisle and th- that sort of situation where he's sort of been bad mouthing the Bombers on the field. I mean, it's certainly not uh, something that. You really want to see, is it? Oh, I don't think you want to see it, but I think that with the sort of crap that the club has put uh, all the Essendon players through, I think it's understandable. But it does, it's like, it's one of those red flags for other clubs. You know, you start wondering, okay, is it the club or is it the player? I think we've seen enough of both of them to realise it's probably the club at this point. So I wouldn't be take too much out of it, really. It's not a good look and it's bad sort of for both of them, but it's worse for Essendon. Has he sort of shat on his own doorstep a little bit? I mean, he's obviously going to find a new club. Someone's going to, you know, trade pretty well for the Bombers for him, I would think. But in terms of money-wise, I mean, last year he just whinged the whole year that he was playing up forward when he wanted to play down back. Now he's wandering around, you know, screaming how he hates the Bombers, you know, on the field and that sort of thing. I mean, has he sort of... Does he come across as an absolute whinger? And has he sort of maybe sort of done some damage in terms of the contract that he's going to get? Consider that he's going to Carlton. I don't think they're going to change anything. They're so yeah. inept and run by all mate Triggy. So I don't think it's mm. probably. If any other club, maybe it would have like hurt his chances. But yeah, I can't really see it making any I, impact. I, just uh, think, I yeah. also think the other the other aspect of that as well is that um, you're in a sh- okay. Let's let's say you're Carlisle and you're in a shitty contract with Essendon, and so the only reason you are really hanging around and not making an absolute fuss is the fact that you've been told certain things like okay, well. Fine, if I'm going to hang around, I'll, I'll hang around a bit longer, but I want to play back. If it doesn't happen, you get shitty about it, you tell everyone about it. Um, that's definitely something that happens in organisations with free agency and free play movement like the NFL. That definitely happens. I remember Terrell Owens uh, being very big on that. He was a bit of a head case, I suppose, in a lot of ways. But, uh, yeah, it's it's just understandable if you feel like your deal's been broken. What was it? Kurt Tippett pretty much came out and said the same thing about the Crows. So um, it's not yeah. always the player. Sometimes it is just... The, the club is not doing what they said they would and then the player has no real option, no real power without actually just coming out and saying, hey, this is just bullshit. So I think that's probably what's happened in this case. And I think when the, the club leadership has got so much going on, uh, they can't really, uh, I guess, put out those little spot fires and every club would have players feeling the same way. You mm. know what I mean? Yeah. Obviously, we had Trengove last year not wanting to play in the ruck because, well, from, from the rumours being that he didn't want to play in the ruck and that's why he's not doing it this year. That's the only real reason I could think of. So clearly that's happening at every club and, and different yep. players see themselves in different roles. But when you've got good uh, guess good leadership uh, in the playing group, good leadership up above, um, you know, from, from the CEO to the coaches to whatever, you can, you can look after your players that way um, and you can make sure that your players aren't, you know, getting to the point where they're telling opposition players on the field, this club's shit and I don't want to be here anymore. Um, but, you know, it's, it's definitely happened in other sports, uh, you know, quite often. Uh, and it's, it's no surprise given what the Essendon players have been through and the really, really shitty year they've had where they've just been getting smashed all year uh, and they've just never even looked like it. Uh, I'm not surprised that some of their players have, uh, have fed up and, um, look, I, you know, if we can get him, I would, you know, obviously we're going to be targeting Dixon, but uh, if, if Dixon fell through, I'd definitely be looking at him. Uh, I'd probably want him to play forward, though. Yeah. I just we drafted him. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Oh, is there anyone else available that we're going to get? get? I think we're all into other... Well, Lockie Henderson's available now. <laughs> He's packed his bags and gone. Wow. Uh, what about Gorringe? <laughs> oh. 
there's a there's a player that's pretty much done the uh, that what what um, Carlisle did to Essendon, but he's done it to us and had a big crack at us when we don't even we don't even his club yet. So uh-huh. yeah, Cafe, no, look, cafes in Adelaide would be shitting themselves. All those <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Oh, what a fast that is! I'm going to show Port, and then he can't even get a kick in the kneeful. So yeah, good work, Daniel. More play. Yeah. So and yeah, that with this obviously they got some decent rucks at the Gold Coast, but yeah, he's had every opportunity to to get himself in and and be the lead ruck there, and yeah, I uh, think just a bit of humility for a player that hasn't even made it yet. Uh, but oh well, mm. up to him. Just I guess. on the Henderson situation, obviously he's uh, he's told Carlton that he wants to be traded. They've said pack your bags and go now. You're not going to play for the rest of the the season. Um, I mean, it seems to be a, quite a bit of a, a different sort of culture across the AFL as opposed to a, a place like Rugby League where players know that the and, and supporters know that certain players are going to be traded or, or they've already signed for a, a new club whilst the season's still going and they quite happily still support them and, and play these guys. And certainly it happens across soccer as well. Do you think that's a good thing for the AFL or, or do you think there needs to be a, a little bit of a culture shift in that regard? Oh, I think it happens with the the draft. Yeah, I think if he was playing for Hawthorne, uh, Hawthorne wouldn't be not playing him because he's he could get him towards a flag. Um, but because uh, because of the way you know the draft and salary cap system that we've got, like I'm pretty sure in rugby league it's all you know they've got their own junior academies and stuff, and they bring players up that way. Um, given given that we need to draft and rebuild, and you know you're constantly rebuilding and trying to, and you know I guess your your premiership clock and your list list management and all that is is important. You can't be playing a player that um, you know everyone already knows how good he is. Playing the last three games isn't going to give any anyone any more information about how good Lockie Henderson is. But putting those three games into a young key forward might be good going forward or something like that. So I think that's just the nature of having having a draft system. Uh, you know, if, if Carlton were going to compete for the flag he'd definitely be playing but there's no sense playing him now is there uh, not on the system we've got I think that Carlton it's absolutely I agree it's totally understandable why they do it and there's lots of really good logical reasons to do it but I think if anyone should be kicking up a fuss uh, it's no one else other than the AFL Players Association who should be sticking up for their member getting match payments that they should otherwise be earning um, I think that's the only party that really should be making a stink about this and obviously Henderson himself if he thinks he should be getting those payments which he probably does um, if you if you are performing to the level uh, that is required to be in the senior side, and the only reason that can be given for your exclusion is that they don't like you anymore, uh, not not your football performance or anything else, and that's you know um, under any workplace that's a discrimination essentially. Uh, and I think you've yeah. got a case there. And I think if I was the AFLPR, I'd be making it very clear that you don't do that without a total agreement between the player and the club. Just think, uh, why did he come out now? There were three games to go and say I want to be traded. Surely you could say on you know August the 29th or whenever the last game is, come out the, that evening and say I don't want to play anymore. You know, uh, or I don't want to play for Carlton anymore. It just seems like a weird time to do it. It's Maybe probably... they're, they're going through a review or something, but it seems like a strange time to do it. Uh, the uh, I think Tyler Terrell is a bit hit and miss, but he said I think his thing was uh, you know uh, Lockie had to announce that he wants to leave Carlton to have a crack at playing AFL football. And that's pretty much it at the moment, isn't it? Just a, a, a of the club. That's right. I'm going to go see. Last them. question I've got. Last question I've got is: uh, Is James Heard now completely damaged goods? Will he get another job in football? Uh, maybe in the media. Maybe in the yeah. media. Yeah. Years down the track. Not Even the worst character seems to be able to pop up in the media years later. Wayne Carey, being an example yeah. of this. Yeah, all he's uh, really going to do is follow Tim Watson into swearing his soul to Channel 7 uh, and he'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, I, I'd be surprised, uh, yeah, if he didn't get a job in the media eventually. He's very, uh, he's got the media personality, I guess, that he's very uh, into himself and you can see him being a part of the, you know, Channel 9 Boys Club or something like that and, you know, backslapping yeah. and telling everyone how, you know, how great they are, so... I think it'll be a, a little while. Uh, I think, as as Dylan said with Kerry, it, it won't happen straight away. But um, you know, if he's if he's pretty good in the media, I'd be surprised if he didn't end up putting a spot there. Yeah. Absolutely damaged. Well, he was on, on on the couch for a while, wasn't he, for two or yeah. three seasons? So that's yeah. right. And when, with the whole Willy Wony, and I think Essen are probably wishing that he'd never yeah. finally agree <laughs> to it. Um, yeah. So yeah, look, I think it'll be a, a few years, but definitely damaged goods for a uh, for a footy club. You just couldn't bring him in now if you were if you were serious. Um, yeah. What could he bring that you know that someone else couldn't bring without all the baggage? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Johnny Butcher, eh? 
Yeah. Johnny, sure. <laughs> so good. <laughs> I, I cannot wait. This is it's just made the season for me. I was very uh very downtrodden uh towards the end of the season, probably since about round thirteen when it was pretty clear our season was done. Uh so this has really given me uh, you know, some positives. I'm going away to the Gold Coast game, so better watch them again, oh, hopefully, nice. against some young guys and hopefully crash some packs and kick a big bag. <laughs> I, I guess the only thing that I'm really concerned about with the, the love of John Butcher is that I think he plays a style of game that, if it works, it's really fun for crowds to watch. But there's plenty of those styles of game that are fun for crowds to watch that don't win premierships and don't necessarily make you a great player. And I'm worried, I worry that he's in that bracket where it's a good trick um, but he needs to be everything else as well. Like, that's my main concern with Butcher. I which is fine. Think. Which is fine criticism, but our list doesn't really have anyone else to come yeah, and fill that sort of. Yeah, absolutely. Word. We don't have anyone to say, oh, "Butcher, you're out right now." Totally agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I guess the theory was we didn't play him all 2014. Uh, despite me pulling my hair out and screaming for it in every isolation <laughs> thread. Uh, we didn't play him at all. Uh, and then we clearly addressed the need for another key forward by uh, trading in, trading our first pick for, for Ryder. Uh, and then, you know, we wanted to play him as a forward. And, you know, it's just clearly we, we, we like that kind of big marking forward and we recognise that we need one. It just would have been nice if we played him. If we get Dixon, though, it all becomes academic and uh, he'll probably go back to the SNFL if, we, if he stays on our list. Yeah. So... All right. Well, I think we might uh, stop the podcast there and uh, and move on, and uh, hopefully to a winning weekend. Hopefully, my uh, prediction doesn't come true of a seventy six point loss, and hopefully Johnny Butcher does kick three goals. Though. That would be that would be nice in in a win. Maybe if you can kick the uh, the winning goal, that'd be good. He does like a, a goal to get us back in front, so that'd be nice. <laughs> he would have to be on the goal line for it to go in and even then it's no guarantee after his kick against Norwood earlier this year but we won't mention that <laughs> no, no, I reckon he's, I reckon he's, he's money when uh, when it's the, the shot will put us back in front I reckon that's, that's when he's at his best Adelaide last year GWS this year he's proven he's proven John John Clutcher <laughs> John Clutcher <laughs> John Clutcher <laughs> oh that's gold yeah, I love it oh, that's awful all right, peeps. Until next time, go Port Adelaide. Go Port Adelaide. the running Francis. It's deafening at Footy Park. It's like finals footy. Oh. Tretre marks at half forward. He's lifted as well, Tretre. Five marks for him this afternoon to the goal square. Chad Corns is the man of the moment. Can't do it this time. Stewie Jew right